In April 1964, Malcolm traveled to Saudi Arabia. For some time, he had been studying Orthodox Islam. Now he arrived in Jeddah on his way to perform the Hajj, a pilgrimage required of all Muslims. Members of the Saudi royal family helped him gain entry to the holy city of Mecca. My first impression of him was, was an eye-opener because I saw a different person totally. I didn't see the fiery uh, fire breather. Uh, I saw a very uh, timid, almost, shy man. When a person performs a hajj, there are certain rituals through which he has to go. All people have to dress in the same simple way. And as such, you cannot distinguish during the hajj any people on account of their status, on account of their national origin. It is a demonstration of human brotherhood. Because everybody was in this white garb, the rich, the poor, the powerful, the, the weak, the sick, the, everybody. And they were all intermingled. And I think that had such a profound impact on Malcolm. Greetings from the holiest and most sacred city on earth. I often think of the warm friendliness of your wonderful family, Brother Malcolm. Greetings from the ancient land of Arabia. Allah has blessed me to visit the holy city of Mecca, where I witness pilgrims of all colors, and all colors is underlined, from all parts of this earth, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood like I've never seen before. It is truly a sight to behold. El Haj Malik El Shabazz. And I guess maybe he thought I wouldn't know who that was, so in parenthesis, he has Malcolm X. Malcolm's letters to his followers made news back in America and raised the question, had he changed his position on race? He does speak of brotherhood, the brotherhood of all races, colors, and so on in the Holy Land. He okay. says there were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans, but were all participating in the same ritual displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experiences in America had led me to believe could never exist between the white and the non-white. But he has backtracked a little from the position that all white men are devils if he's saying that... I wouldn't say, that he, is, uh, I wouldn't say that he is backtracked. One can make an adjustment in one's direction without it being backwards. If when you say that he is backtracked, it seems as though that you imply you would prefer that he call white people devils and not to call them devils that he's going in the wrong direction. Nobody likes to be called a devil. Oh, well, then, I, then you wouldn't consider it a backtrack if he stopped calling white people no. devils, then, would you? After his pilgrimage, Malcolm spent three weeks in Africa. On May 21st, two days after his 39th birthday, he returned to New York. Malcolm, have your experiences with uh, white-skinned Muslims in uh, Africa, in the Middle East, made you feel that uh, relations between Negroes and whites who are not Muslims is any more possible? Uh, when I was in on the pilgrimage, I had close contact with Muslims whose skin would in America be classified as white and with Muslims who themselves would be classified as white in America. But these particular Muslims didn't call themselves white. They looked upon themselves as human beings, as part of the human family, and therefore they looked upon all other segments of the human family as part of that same family. Well, now, uh, they had a different look or a different air or a different attitude than that which is uh, reflected in the uh, attitude of the man in America who calls himself white. So I said that if uh, Islam had done this, done that for them, 
Perhaps if the white man in America would study Islam, perhaps it could do the same thing for him. Malcolm, just Are to you prepared to go into the United Nations at this point and ask that charges be brought against the United States for its treatment of American Negroes? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, yes. Please. I think you're right in my chair. The audience will have to be quiet. <laughs> uh, yes, the, as I pointed out when I was in, during my traveling, that nations look, African nations and Asian nations and Latin American nations look very hypocritical when they stand up in the United Nations condemning the racist practices of South Africa and that which is practiced by Portugal and Angola and saying nothing in the UN about the racist practices uh, that are, that are uh, manifest every day against Negroes in this society. As media attention increasingly focused on Malcolm, the Nation of Islam stepped up its attacks and filed eviction papers to force him from his home. Malcolm in the uh, spring and early summer of uh, 1964 was in a desperate situation with the Nation of Islam and the one weapon he had left was his knowledge of the messengers and discretions with various women uh, who were working for him as secretaries. He called one guy at the New York Herald Tribune and tried to interest him in the story. It was considered libelous, so they wouldn't do it. When Malcolm appeared in court to challenge the eviction proceedings, he used the trial to reveal the private affairs of Elijah Muhammad. Why are they threatening your life? Well, uh, primarily because they're afraid that I will tell the real reason that they've been that I'm out of the black Muslim movement, which I never told, I kept to myself. But the real, real reason is that Elijah Muhammad, the head of the movement, is the father of eight children by six different teenage girls, different, uh, six different teenage girls who were his private personal secretaries. That was, that was a serious uh, thing, a most serious thing, and to charge the Elijah Muhammad with such uh, would be really to take your own life and take your life in your own hands. You know, you would be risking your life. I'm just being plain. I'm being open and plain with you. It would really mean that you, somebody, might kill you in the nation of Islam. Are you not perhaps afraid of what might happen to you as a result of making these revelations? Oh yes, I probably am a dead man already. What but, do you mean? Uh, well, uh, when you know, when you understand the makeup of the Muslim movement and the psychology of the Muslim movement. As long as uh, any, if I, I myself, in, by having confidence in the leader of the Muslim movement, if someone came to me and I had no knowledge whatsoever of what had taken place and they told me what I'm saying, I would kill them myself. The only thing that would prevent me from killing someone who made a statement like this, they would have to be able to let me know that it's true. Now, if anyone had come to me other than Mr. Muhammad's son, I never would have believed it even enough to look into it. But I had been around him so closely, I had seen indications of, it, of, it, uh, of the reality of it, but my religious sincerity made me block it out of my mind. At the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem, Malcolm announced the formation of a political group modeled after the organization of African unity overseas. Alaikum. Brother Malcolm formed the organization of Afro-American unity uh, for those of us who were interested in his political, economic, and cultural programs. I think he was aware that there were people out there, you know, from his travels around, that there were people, people out there who wanted to work with him, but who were not prepared to become Muslims in order to do so. One of the first things that the independent African nations did was to form an organization called the Organization of African Unity. This organization of Afro-American Unity which has the same aim and objective, to fight whoever gets in our way. <laughs> to bring about the complete independence of people of African descent here in the Western Hemisphere and first here in the United States. And bring about the freedom of these people by any means necessary. In July 1964, Malcolm was invited to join heads of state from Africa and the Middle East at the Organization of African Unity Conference in Cairo, Egypt.
Malcolm X saw no contradiction between the African fight and the black American fight in the United States. He thought one was an extension of the other. He can draw support from one to enhance the other. In the 1960s, Africans had a lot of misgivings about American foreign policy in Africa. Because unfortunately at that time, the American foreign policy was supportive of the colonial policies of countries like Belgium. And the only voice which was echoing the aspiration of the Africans in the United States was that of Malcolm. And there were many Americans who came, but none, none, without exception, who had the impact that Malcolm had. The man of a message. And the message was not to America only. Malcolm, what is your purpose here? Well, my purpose here is to remind the uh, African heads of the state that there are 22 million of us in America who are also of African descent. And to remind them also that we are the victims of uh, America's colonialism or American imperialism. And that our problem is not an American problem, it's a human problem. It's not a Negro problem, it's a problem of humanity. It's not a problem of civil rights, but a problem of human rights. Malcolm traveled to 14 African nations and met with 11 heads of state. U.S. intelligence agencies followed him from country to country. In Nigeria, he was given the name Omawale, the sun returns. When my father was abroad, we had a world map on the living room wall. And any time you got a little lonesome and wondered where daddy was, we'd run over to that map. And where is he now? And he's in Cairo, which is the capital of Egypt. And he's over here with Nkrumah. And he's over here. So there was a different kind of passage that we maintained when he was abroad. Malcolm returned in late November 1964. He resumed the weekly OAAU rallies at the Audubon Ballroom and continued his collaboration with Alex Haley on his autobiography. He said, you know, I'm writing this book and I don't really know about doing this book. He had some problems with the family having to uh, be subjected to what the things that he would say. I said, Malcolm, you know what? None of us are going to ever amount to anything until we get our mother out of Kalamazoo. It had preyed on my mind for years, and I didn't talk about it, but it was eating away. And he looked at me like, I'm glad you said that, because it's been bothering me too. And he said, Bonnie, promise, I'll do something. And the next thing, Malcolm never got back to me. The next thing I knew, I got a call. My mother was in Lansing at my brother Filbert's. And he later told me that he, it had been pent up in him all these years. He didn't want to think about it. He didn't, certainly didn't want to talk about it because he f did not feel good about it. But he felt so great when he and his brother came together to have their mother released. In December 1964, Malcolm debated at the Oxford Union in England. I read once, passingly, about a man named Shakespeare. I only read about him passingly, but I remember one thing he wrote that kind of moved me. Uh, he put it in the mouth of Hamlet, I think it was, who said, to be or not to be. He was in doubt about something. <laughs> Whether it was nobler in the mind of man to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, moderation or to take up arms against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. And I go for that 